This is a picture taken in 1988. I was with my parents and siblings. And to give you a clue to identify me in this picture, I wasn't wearing a suit on that Sunday morning. But today, I didn't forget my suit. Growing up as a child, my dad, who was a telecom engineer, he was also an alumni of this great university. He used to take me to, he would take me to the Ghana Telecom switch room and break down the concept of telecommunications and explain to me how it was possible for me to speak to my auntie who was living in the US at the time. This was a telephone we had at that time. Only large corporates, government institutions, and a few privileged homes had this in their houses. Less than 50,000 users were able to have access to this technology. It was based on a fixed line connectivity. To have this, it meant that we have to wire a copper cable to wherever you are before you could be able to communicate. And there was a limitation because we couldn't run physical cables to everyone to communicate. So there was a need for us to get mobility. And the challenge with this was that when you were not in the house, you couldn't communicate with anyone. So there was a need for us to get a solution that will address the ability to communicate whilst you're on the move. So in the early 90s, the mobile technology was invented. In fact, it was in 1991 when the first commercial 2G network was launched in Finland. Interesting enough, it just took one year after when Ghana saw its first 2G network, and it was introduced by a company called Mobitel. Today, they are no more. They've changed their names in various forms. But this was a kind of hand, handheld device we were used to at the time, and it was a rare privilege. You know the pride that the iPhone users have? That was the same pride the users of this phone had. They used to say, Mijina Bontina me kasano. Meaning, I'm actually talking not on a fixed line, but I'm talking on a mobile phone. That was a pride with which the people who had this were having. So businesses adopted this technology to be productive at what they do. And indeed, the internet also grew. But to introduce internet, the first technology that brought about internet was again the fixed line, where we had a dial-up on a normal narrowband technology, which wasn't too fast. When you open one web browser, you have to go and have your lunch and come back before the whole page will load. But it was OK. Uh, my brother was able to use some of these tools. He was a graphic designer at the time in a design house. He leveraged on those tools. He leveraged on the mobile phone that I showed you earlier to communicate with his colleagues, even outside working hours, so that he could meet deadlines. Many other businesses leveraged on these technologies to be productive, and it changed the fortunes of those businesses that use that technology. And people could only get jobs because they had the ability to be able to use the technological tools that were available at the time. One shocking thing was that even with the introduction of mobile technology at the time, there were only few people that had access to it. The population of Ghana in 1999 was about 80 million and yet only 68,000 people had access to communication. This was a very bad situation because we needed to connect everybody. That meant that government put in the right framework to encourage telecom operators to make the investment to fast track the development of ICT infrastructure to enable everybody to have access to communication. So in the beginning of 2000, there was a massive rollout of communication and I was coming out of university at the time, and I joined the campaign to help the operators to drive this, this growth. And we had introduced a lot of cell sites to create the coverage. The world saw the introduction of 3G in 2001, but it was not until 2009 when Ghana saw the first 3G booming the internet connectivity in Ghana. In 2010, we also saw the introduction of mobile money. We changed the way small businesses could do business, even though they couldn't open a bank account. These were exciting times for these businesses. And it's, it, it will interest you to note that in 1999, when I was entering into this great university, like I said, there were just 68,000 connectivity. But as a result of the massive infrastructure rollout that we did, just within a 10-year period, 
we had moved the 68,000 people who had access to communication to 15.3 million. And this was only possible because of the massive infrastructure that we put in place to help people have access to communications. Now, what did this give rise to? Now, people, there are a lot more people who had connectivity. So we are between 2010 and 2020, we are in a digital era, thereabouts. Now, in this period, we saw the introduction of 4G. We saw the introduction of 5G. We, we've heard about cloud computing. Prof, I heard Prof talking about machine learning, AI, robotics. All of these things happen in this period. And these were really, really exciting times for, for the industry. In fact, there was a lot of reasons for operators to make a lot more money in this, in this era because the technology was just amazing. And it will, it will also interest you to know that because of the fast emerging pace of technology, it was actually the tool for businesses to remain relevant. And businesses that did not adopt the use of these emerging technologies became extinct. Businesses that failed to innovate using these technologies are no more. We could talk about a lot of them, but that is not, we are still on that time machine. Now, digital, digital, digital adoptions of data um, technologies also disrupted a lot of old business models. And in fact, it was actually in 1995 when Don Tapscott predicted that there will be a certain digital economy driven by digital technologies. And businesses that knew about this, or businesses that took what Don Tapscott said in 1995, had an early mover advantage. And we could talk about Amazon. That actually started the business of e-commerce, taking advantage of that prediction that Don Tapscott gave at the time. Now, in, in, the, in, the, in the adoption of data technologies disrupting business models, we could, have, we could talk about quite a few of them. Today, if you want to, you don't need to have a TV station to broadcast. Kevin Taylor has his own audience and is broadcasting on YouTube and Facebook. He doesn't have to build an infrastructure and own a TV station to address a wide uh, uh, population. Drew's work is all on social media and it's all made possible by all these digital platforms. Businesses like transportation was disrupted by Uber, boats and the like. We also can talk about how even the telecommunication industry was disrupted by WhatsApp. When WhatsApp was introduced in 2009, it disrupted the revenues of the telecom operators because you could make international calls without paying IDD or you could make international calls without paying roaming charges, all because of technology evolution. These applications changed the way we lived, even changed the way we shop. With a lot of e-commerce platforms available, it changed how even small businesses could set up without renting a shop. On Jumia, you can just set up your own shop and you can start trading without necessarily having to go and pay huge sums of rent to start your business. So as a young person, you are in an, you are in an environment where you can kickstart without a huge investment. Now, we are back from our journey into 30 years ago, so we are back into today. There are a lot of things happening today because we are in our most transformational time in our human history because the changes are happening at a lightning speed. Now, we are at a stage where there are a lot of connected devices globally. Even though we are just 8, 8 billion population globally, there are about 12 billion connected devices. In Ghana, we are about 30 million people, but there are 45 million connected devices today. So we've done a lot of the connectivity. And this connectivity is giving rise to what we call the big data. And this big data is giving rise to what we call the Internet of Things. This Internet of Things is powering artificial intelligence and machine learning. And machine learning is powering robots. Robots will do some of our jobs. In fact, it will replace 20% of the world's job, but it will, it will allow us to do what is more important. Now, you are in this exciting period. So what is at stake for us in the next 20 years? So this is a picture of me 20 years into the future. That I'll be about in my 60s. And this was generated uh, with an AI tool. 
Maybe we've got God giving us grace. When we get there, you can compare this feature and see whether the AI tool was accurate or not. But in the future, what will matter most, first of all, is the kind of digital skills that you have today to take the, the to make the most out of the changing trends. It also it will be a period where Africa, through a collaboration with its regulators, will create an African, an indigenous African tech giant. This is what will happen in the next 20 years. And I believe it will be one of you guys sitting in this room because you don't need to wait to be employed. You can create your own business model just like Jeff Bezos did. Now, when robots is taking part of our jobs and is doing a lot of things that human beings can do, what will become very important in the future? What do you think will become very important in the future if AI is doing a lot of things that we can do today? A robots can do a lot of things, but robots can never have emotional intelligence. What cannot be automated will become extremely important in the future. So think about skills like emotions, empathy, creativity, imagination, ethics. These are the skills that will be very, very vital for you in the future. So you, what do you need to do to survive in this future? First, you must sharpen your digital skills, which I think you have. But most importantly, you must sharpen your empathy. You must sharpen your creative skills. You must sharpen your way of collaborating with others. And most importantly, you must have your ethics. Now, for you to survive in the future, you need to, you need to remember that human only traits will drive the next phase of technology evolution. In order not to be replaced by technology, you need to sharpen your human-only traits. Thank you.